Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at VAFB.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce the wonderful local products we enjoy. Brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Virginia farmers export millions of dollars worth of farm products each year. We'll follow one shipment to the Port of Virginia. Chef Tammy delivers a delicious maple and cabbage treat to start off the fall right. And we celebrate Virginia Wine Month with a visit to some of the state's southernmost wineries. Home will always be Virginia Between the Blue Ridge and Chesapeake Bay Home in my heart always. Welcome back to Real Virginia, everyone. We're coming to you this week from the Port of Virginia Richmond Terminal on the banks of the James River. Trade has always been an integral part of Virginia's agriculture economy. But once a shipment of soybeans, corn, or other products is picked up at the farm, what happens next? Let's join Burke Muller as we follow a soybean shipment from farm to freighter. Virginia farmers know that many of the goods they sell are sent overseas. We've been given access to what happens behind the scenes at the Port of Virginia when a shipment of soybeans arrives at the Richmond facility and where it goes from there. The soybeans arrive from the farm in a hopper truck that dumps them out of the bottom. These trucks are capable of carrying 1,000 bushels of soybeans weighing 60,000 pounds. Once the hopper truck is empty, the beans are fed into storage silos until a container is ready to take on the shipment. They are delivered here, we unload, we grade, we store for a short period of time, and then we reload export based on bookings that we get for overseas delivery. The container we're following arrives at the Richmond facility but before it can be loaded, it first has to be inspected for cleanliness by the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Once the container is cleared, the beans are fed from the silos into the container along a covered conveyor belt. The container is loaded from the back end, and when that section is full, the truck backs up a few feet to bring in more product. The container can carry nearly 60,000 pounds of bulk soybeans. Once it's full, the truck drives off to the storage area of the port to wait for its next destination. Forbes Lowe manages Schooler's operations. My family has been in agriculture forever. Uh, both of my grandparents were farmers. My dad and my uncle were farmers for a short period of time. My uncle ran a farm service for his whole career of 40 years. Uh, I did 12 years at a farm service, was there um, fertilizer management specialist. During peak harvest season, they can load more than 80 containers per day. Most of these shipments are destined for China, Vietnam, Taiwan, and Malaysia. Full containers are loaded onto a barge. This one is called the Virginia Express and towed down the James River to one of the Port of Virginia's primary container facilities, the Norfolk International Terminals. Our container was loaded onto the barge early in the afternoon, but it was several hours later, around 7 o'clock, before it began the journey downriver. Well before daybreak, Captain Eric Wernick drove me and Greg Edwards from the Port of Virginia from a dock in Norfolk to meet the barge carrying our container of soybeans. We had to travel in his small motor launch down the Elizabeth River, where downtown Norfolk remained lit and eerily silent. It's a no-wake zone, so we had to move slowly until we reached Hospital Point, just south of the Midtown Tunnel. Free of the no-wake zone, we sped quickly to meet the Virginia Express and our container of soybeans. In the pitch black, only the lights from the tug are visible, but as the sky brightened, we could soon see the barge, and with it came a new appreciation of how efficient container shipping has become. Even on this smaller barge, containers are stacked several units high. It doesn't take long before the Virginia Express barge reaches its destination, the Norfolk International Terminals. One of the deepest commercial ports on the U.S. East Coast, it processed 3.7 million TEUs in the fiscal year that concluded in June 2022. A new record. TEU stands for 20-foot equivalent unit, a container 20 feet long. 
Our soybean container is 40 feet long, so it's considered two TEUs. In any given week, more than 35,000 TEUs move through the Norfolk terminals. The thing that has really been uh, a game changer in the agricultural industry is the ability to bulk load agricultural product into containers. 20 and 25 years ago, the idea of bulk loading containers with ag was unheard of. You had to ship agricultural products in bulk in bulk vessels. But the ability now to access empty containers, 20 foot, 40 foot containers, and bulk load a product like soybeans or soybean meal into that container has really revolutionized the industry. It's enabled shippers, smaller shippers, to enter international markets and it's enabled them to secure customers who may not necessarily be able to buy 50,000 tons of their product, but they could buy five containers worth of their product. So that's been a very fundamentally positive change for the industry and for the port as well in our ability to handle those exports. The Port of Virginia also has a major facility in Northern Virginia known as the Virginia Inland Port. It was built in Front Royal as a way for shippers to avoid Baltimore and the DC Baltimore traffic congestion. Cargo can be loaded there, then brought by rail directly to the Norfolk International Terminals. The presence of the Virginia Inland Port has been a catalyst attracting investment from companies like Family Dollar, Home Depot and others into the northern Shenandoah Valley. They built brick and mortar facilities in close proximity to the inland port and of course they are our very significant customers. Export and trade activities at the Port of Virginia have a major impact on Virginia's economy. Edwards says they generate more than 437,000 jobs and 47 billion each year in gross state product. Maritime commerce generates more than 100 billion in total economic impact throughout the Commonwealth on an annual basis. The business school at the College of William and Mary regularly conducts uh, an economic impact study on behalf of the port and it has been determined that one in ten jobs across Virginia are tied to some type of maritime activity here in the port, not necessarily purely container business but also the coal industry and other bulk and break bulk activities that take place here. Ten percent of the Virginia workforce has some attachment to maritime commerce. The great thing about being on port is having ready labor available and the combination of having massive quantities of boxes that we can float through. Like I might have three or four different bookings open at the same time going to several different ship lines so that if I run out of equipment in one truck line, I can easily move my computer over to another truck line and just keep right on going. These 170 foot cranes will eventually unload all the containers on the barge, including the one carrying our soybeans. From there, algorithms created in the port's control room will determine where and when that container will be loaded. The soybean shipment we've been tracking is just one of thousands of containers processed daily here at the Port of Virginia, destined for our trading partners around the world. In Norfolk, Virginia, I'm Burke Moeller reporting. Overseas farm sales are consistently one of the bright spots for American exports. Based on current sales trends, the U.S. Department of Agriculture estimates farm sales to overseas buyers in 2022 will top $193.5 billion. That's $30 billion more than the all-time record set in 2014. The current war between Russia and Ukraine underscores just how valuable farm trade is around the world. In 2021, Virginia exported $4.1 billion in farm products. That was a 28% increase over 2020 sales. Soybeans, wood products, tobacco, and poultry are some of the top exports from the Old Dominion. I'm Mark Viette. Coming up on In the Garden, I'm going to talk about opening up your garden. So stay with us. We are stronger, together, especially at this difficult time. For over 90 years, we've watched our membership grow, and we're honored to be part of such a special community. Thank you to the farmers who provide for us every day. Virginia Farm Bureau is proud to serve our members, their families, and to give back to our local communities. That's the Farm Bureau way. It's quite common for trees to put too much shade on a garden over time. Mark Viette shows us how to open things up in the garden. 
When I mentioned opening up your garden, I'm talking about opening your garden to more sunlight. One of the problems we face is, you know, after 10, 15, 20 years or longer, our trees get bigger and bigger. They have more leaves and foliage, more branches and stems, and they can give you a very shady or heavily shaded garden where lawns won't grow and certain plants won't grow, so you can open up your garden. And that means removing certain branches, limbing up some of these branches, like this crab apple here had limbs extending 20 feet out from right here and right here, very shady. A truck couldn't even pull under them. So I opened up this garden and now I can grow many more plants. Let me tell you how you're gonna do that. Now, this is a pro tip. If you don't have the ability or the gear or protective gear, hire someone to do your tree pruning. And the reason I want to show you this is so you know what to ask for. If you had somebody who was going to come in and tip this or cut this all back all around, that's not the way to prune. Uh, that's called dehorning or deantlering of trees, and that could actually kill a tree. But if you don't have the gear, hire someone. If you have the gear, please be careful. I recommend never getting on a ladder when you're pruning. But what I am gonna do first is I come through and I limb up the sides so I can actually see what I should do with this tree. These are really good heavy duty loppers. They're some of the best loppers. They're easy to handle so you can come in and cut branches. This will cut branches up to an inch and a half in diameter. And it's hard to find those. So I'm coming through and you're gonna notice when you do this, it is gonna open up this whole tree. Never take more than 20% of the entire tree out at any one point in time. And I'm sure you're going to see a noticeable difference just by removing those few limbs. Now comes the fun part. And it's also important to make sure everywhere around the tree is clear of branches so you don't trip. I've opened up the tree. I've not tipped it back. There's a few more branches I may take out, maybe one or two of the lower branches coming down. But other than that, you can now see the light and you can see my face just by taking out some of the central branches of this tree. And now I can grow dailies, I can better grow hostas. And 
you don't do this every year. You do this once every 10 or 15 years. This tree's never been done before. It's the first time. And it's been in this garden here for 25 years. I'm Mark Viet. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Hi, I'm Tammy Brawley from The Green Kitchen. Coming up on Heart of the Home, crispy maple mustard cabbage. We hope you'll stay with us. And now, a sneak peek into a day in the life of a Virginia dairy cow. They get their day started. They have some lunch. Get some exercise. Spend time with their friends and then end their day with dairy sweet dreams. Real dairy, real life, real delicious. Virginia maple syrup is delicious any time of the year, but fall is when cabbage is fresh off the farm. Chef Tammy Brawley shows us how to mix the two for a tasty treat in the heart of the home. I'm Tammy Brawley from The Green Kitchen. I'm here today to show you guys how to do crispy maple mustard cabbage. I love changing the way you do typical recipes because it always tastes better. Um, a lot of people will boil cabbage. This is roasted and I love roasting all sorts of vegetables. First, when you get your cabbage head, you want to go ahead and pull off those outer, softer sort of green leaves. You don't really need those. You want to take a very nice sharp knife, being very careful because you are, you're rolling something and you could slip. So you want to cut off the core. And now we want to cut it into wedges. Don't worry about extra leaves if they come off. Sometimes it's easier to go this way and you have a nice flat surface to work with. I am going to go ahead and do it this way because I want to see how thick my wedges are going to be. Once I get through the core, that's when I can determine how wide I want the wedges and whether or not I want to take the core out. We'll start with the smaller one. I think I will go ahead and try to take the core out. It will be a little bit difficult. You just want to be very careful. And I can come through the back side of it. And there we have it. The cores come out fairly nicely. Maybe cut out a tad more. And now I want to cut it into wedges for my pan here. I'm going to say let's do fourths. So we've got a half, another fourth, and then a fourth there as well. Now I like to keep a bottle of olive oil in a spray. It makes things nice and handy. I spray the aluminum foil with the olive oil. And then we are going to go ahead and put our wedges on here. I have my oven preheating to 400 degrees. Try to keep the wedges intact. They uh, not only do they, they roast better, but they also taste a little bit better. So now we're going to come back to our bowl. So we're going to actually use about three or four tablespoons of stone ground mustard. I love a stone ground mustard. So we've got about three in there, maybe a little bit more. And we're going to add a couple of tablespoons of maple syrup. This is actually creating my favorite flavor profile. I'm going to go ahead and do a third. My favorite flavor profile of sweet and spicy together. And a couple of tablespoons of olive oil. I'm not going to measure. I'm just going to open my little spray bottle there. I'm going to take a whisk or a fork. Mix that up. You want it to be somewhat um, loose in nature, but you still want to make sure you get that delicious stone ground mustard and maple syrup together. Take a brush, you can take a spoon or you can do this by hand if you'd like, and you want to brush the cabbage. So get a nice coverage area on the cabbage. If they come apart, don't, don't stress about that. They're still going to be delicious. Sometimes I like to say that it tastes better if it's messy. Just going to get a nice coverage. Remember that we're going to come back with a second layer of this after they've roasted about 20 minutes. And then we want to hit it with a little bit of salt and pepper. All right, a little salt here. Typical ratios for salt and pepper is about twice as much salt as pepper. Keep that in mind. All right, and there you have it. They're nice and coated. We're going to pop them in the oven for about 20 minutes, and then we're going to turn them over and roast the other side. So our cabbage has been in for about 20 minutes. We're going to pull it out.
Oh, gosh, it smells so good. So we're going to turn our wedges over and we're going to baste the other side. You can see they've gotten somewhat soft. And I really wish you could smell this. And we've got quite a bit of sauce here, so I'm, I'm not going to be bashful with it. I think you should use as much as you'd like on it. It's just going to roast and give it a nice complimentary flavor. And in all honesty, I think this sauce would be delicious on any sort of a grilled meat, a grilled pork, or a grilled chicken. But I love doing it on cabbages. And back into the oven for another 20 minutes. It's perfectly roasted, smells heavenly. We're going to put it on our serving platter. I would love to take a bite of this, but I really don't want to risk burning the roof of my mouth. And there you have it, a great way to use up that delicious cabbage growing in your garden. Crispy maple mustard cabbage, maple syrup, stone ground mustard, a little bit of olive oil, salt and pepper into the oven for about 20 minutes, flip it, baste it again and another 20 minutes. I'm Tammy Brawley with The Green Kitchen. Join us next time on Heart of the Home. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafb.com slash recipes, as well as on Chef Tammy Brawley's website at greenkitchenrichmond.com. Cabbage is raised on 825 acres in Virginia on 263 farms. It's not a major crop in the Old Dominion, but it's a favorite of backyard gardeners and at farmers markets. Cabbage is a cold crop, like broccoli, that is resistant to cold temperatures. In fact, it thrives in them and withers in the hot summer sun. As such, most commercial cabbage growers are in the cooler mountains of western and southwest Virginia. Fall is the best season for most growers to raise cabbage, although some growers use greenhouses and hoop houses to raise a spring crop. October is Virginia Wine Month, and there are dozens of wineries where wine lovers can taste their favorite vintage. Barry Ridgeway takes us to a new location where you can sniff and sip a Virginia wine. Historically, tobacco was one of the state's biggest cash crops, especially in Southern Virginia. As tobacco production has declined in recent years, farmers in Southside are looking for new ways to keep their land in the family and in the black. Home Place Vineyard Farm has been in Dad's family for over 100 years, and all of our children have worked in the vineyard. They've grown up from little kids playing in the creek to working in the vineyard. A lot of the fun is having them come pick the grapes or when it's bottling time. That gives us an excellent opportunity to talk and interact with all of our kids. Virginia's wine industry has been growing by leaps and bounds in recent decades as consumers discover quality wines and growers and vintners fine-tune their products. According to the Virginia Wine Board, the economic impact of the wine industry grew 27 percent from 2015 to 2019 to 1.73 billion dollars. The Three Sisters of Shiny Rock near Clarksville, Virginia is part of that trend. They're one of the many family farms that produce Virginia wine. The winery was uh, created as a result of the three daughters wanting to save the family farm, which was established in 1911. And so the farm needs to make money. And the next question was how to do that. And from what we've read, alcohol's a good business. And it's also fun. At the Two Witches Winery and Brewery in Danville, Marvin and Karen Jefferson maintained the vineyard while their children run the winery and brewery. It was a slow process. We had a lot of help, a lot of friends. We started with the two acres over there, the Cab Sav and the Traminette. When my daughter decided to start a winery brewery in Danville, we planted this plot, and this is Petit Verdot and Muscat Blanc. We now have two whites and two reds. The Southern Virginia climate and soil tend to be a bit drier than the northern area, well suited for the transplanted grapes. Our best, I would say, would be our Viognier and our Chamerson. 
It's a red and um, Chamberson is a French hybrid grape that we grow, probably one of our better reds. And then our Viognier, it's only dry white we make off of our vines and it does very well for us. I would ask them to come try it. We have a Appetit Verdot from 2019. I would put up against most. At the Three Sisters of Shiny Rock, growing indigenous grapes makes the task somewhat easier. We're very fortunate in the species of grapes that we, we pick to grow. Uh, muscadines, uh, since they are indigenous, they grow here in the woods uh, all over the place. And so it's, it's not like we have to have special soils or special angles or special anything because they would grow here anyway. The southern region's most popular wines are the sweet, fruity wines. We're probably better known for a fruit wine that we, we produce um, called Cabin Sunset. We buy all those strawberries from um, South Boston, um, Reese's Farms in South Boston, so we still keep it Virginia grown. Wine drinkers should come to Southern Virginia to try our wine. It is a unique wine. We have five different types of wine. As with many other businesses, the pandemic and recent inflation have caused a downturn for the wineries. But with some ingenuity, they began serving wine outside, and local wine lovers were still able to visit. We added our porches onto the outside of the building, and people love the porches. They enjoy the outside. They like looking at the vineyard, and they like looking at the apple trees and, and our uh, ponds and, and such as that. We had some challenges that we had to um, overcome during that period of time and um, we have we came out the backside in a pretty good shape. In 2022, wineries are again local entertainment hotspots, hosting weddings, concerts, and festivals. I think it's great to get people out and socialize. People enjoy being in vineyards. They're beautiful places to see. We enjoy visiting other wineries ourselves even when we're not working here. While the heart of the Virginia wine industry is further north, the wineries of Southern Virginia are proud to add their regional specialties to the full complement of Virginia wines. We are smaller scale wineries. We are more personal. You'll be able to talk to somebody that actually has their hand in the process. So I would really encourage people to come out and just taste what we got. I would say that you find Southern wines as good and more economical. And so uh, I think that's a, a big boon for this area as well. For more information about Virginia wines and wineries, visit virginiawine.org. In Pennsylvania County, this is Barry Ridgway reporting. We're so glad you could join us this week to celebrate all the bounty Virginia has to offer. From the kitchen, to your home and garden, to our beautiful wide open spaces, we are proud to say that this is Real Virginia. For everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a great week. Chesapeake Bay